So welcome to everybody to this panel. My name is Monica Heller. I am the chair of the Committee on Public Engagement of the Société Royale du Canada. Uh, I'm going to give you a few, little bit of background on this panel, uh, and then we'll get going. Our um, essential uh, role as the Committee on Public Engagement is to try to address issues of, that are relevant to public debate. The issue of academic freedom and responsibility has been coming up more and more in various campuses in various ways, and certainly as a matter of general public debate. The Royal Society does not get involved in particular cases, mais nous avons certainement l'expertise et l'intérêt à correspondre à demande de réfléchir généralement à la question qui touche à des questions d'éducation et de recherche. Nous avons établi un groupe de travail, on peut vous expliquer euh, ultérieurement euh, comment. And this working group, which is chaired by Len Finley, who will be joining us in a moment, um, has, we've given it a charge to think through general issues of academic freedom and responsibility, and essentially to provide us with what we think of as tools to think with uh, over the particular issues as we live them in our classrooms, in our universities and research centers, and generally speaking in the, in the world of research and teaching. So this is very early on in the work of the, of the working group. Uh, it's just begun its work. It's got a year to go. It will report in exactly a year from now at the 2022 COEE. And we decided it would be a good moment to have uh, a panel in which the, the issue of what the working group is trying to do, that is provide tools to think with, can be debated, can be discussed. Um, we're interested in feedback. And so we've invited uh, three colleagues, uh, I'll introduce in a moment, to tell us things that they think we really need to be thinking about uh, in order to make sure that the working group uh, gets uh, set off in the right direction. Nous avons aussi fait ça comme panel pour avoir un feedback, une rétroaction générale de la part de tous ceux, toutes celles qui, qui euh, participent, euh, pour avoir euh, votre rétroaction, vos idées sur euh, des thèmes, des questions qu'on devrait euh, euh, prendre en considération. So, um, our, uh, Len Finley is from uh, the University of Saskatchewan. He's a distinguished professor emeritus and a former president of Academy One. Je devrais dire que les biographies complètes sont disponibles pour vous dans le portail, uh, si vous cliquez sur les noms de nos participants, nos participantes. And we've invited um, three speakers uh, to give us commentary. So, Len will talk for briefly about five minutes about the working group uh, and how it's tried to orient itself um, at, this, at this point. Et nous avons invité trois, euh, trois collègues parce qu'elles représentent des points de vue et des expériences très différenciées, très complexes, euh, à la hauteur de la complexité de la question. Uh, and so we will be hearing in order from uh, Professor Melinda Smith, who's Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Research at the University of Calgary and a political scientist. La professeur Srilata Ravi, qui est professeur de littérature francophone au campus Saint-Jean à l'Université de l'Alberta. And from Professor Marie Baptiste, who is a professor emerit uh, in the area of education, particular uh, education autochtone, the University of Saskatchewan, and actuellement uh, au Cap Breton. So I'm now going to hand uh, the mic over to Len. He'll talk for about five minutes. Each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. And we want to keep a good 15, 20 minutes at the end for uh, those of you who are with us to ask questions, please put them in the chat box. They will be filtered through to me. Et on va essayer d'avoir une conversation et de tenir compte du maximum de questions possibles. Évidemment, vous les posez dans la langue de votre préférence. OK, je passe la parole à Len. Professor Finley. <coughs> Merci, Monica, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking from Saskatoon, uh, from Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homelands of the Métis people. Uh, I'm very glad our three discussants have uh, uh, joined us to uh, uh, enrich our thinking, which is at a very early stage. Uh, we're here to uh, 
listen, record, and reflect on, on uh, uh, your concerns. And I am personally willing to follow up with anyone after this session who has issues they seek clarification for or suggestions about things we might address. Uh, the uh, academic freedom and responsibility, uh, let me instantly translate that into a catchy earworm admonition, <clears throat> which is taking liberties with freedom. That is that that phrase captures the idea of the usefulness of freedom, but that all freedoms are prone to abuse and to imperiling good versions of freedom uh, by demonstrating uh, bad ones. The uh, issues of academic freedom and responsibility are really topical. Uh, they have a massive antecedent history. They have a turbulent, ever-expanding, volatile present. And we are have had to divide our work up into small groups in order to make it at least uh, provisionally manageable on our way to uh, to the kinds of uh, tools for thinking that we, we hope to provide uh, at the end of this process. Uh, I got it, yeah, she doesn't forget all. Um, so there already was a question. Oh yeah? She already answered it though. It's about when the report's coming out. How would they see the slide out? Amelia has a microphone on. Amber? So Amber, we can put Oh, sorry, Zoom too. Lynn, um, I mean, uh, Madison says we can continue. Okay, well, so we've uh, divided our, uh, into two, three or four people in each of four writing pods, okay. and we're we are drafting uh, materials. Sorry, I um, thought it was one of those people that wanted to chime in. Also, Monica's microphone is on. Uh, Madison. We're hearing something in the background. Can we continue? Okay, let's, Len, let's keep trying. <laughs> so we have, uh, so we have four preliminary lenses, uh, which we were using to bring to bear on this mass of material uh, possibilities and uh, uh, challenging realities. The first part is working on the notion of a paradigm shift in, in post-secondary education. And if there is one or more, what would that do to how we customarily understand academic freedom and the responsibilities that attend its exercise. The two uh, possibilities we're looking at for uh, uh, paradigm shift are the nature of knowledge production. That is one of the, the focuses. Uh, and the other is the explicit commitment of post-secondary institutions uh, to uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. That particular com commitment seems to have inaugurate or consolidate or at least advance the notion of an academy that looks very different, that acts, speaks very differently, that acts in ways that uh, are clearly a radical and uh, one hopes desirable departure uh, from the, the sort of such institutions in this country. The second of our pods works on academic freedom, uh, uh, responsibility, and universalism and particularism, and will bring forward a narrative about under placing academic freedom as a derivation from the large movements under the aegis of human rights uh, inaugurated in 1948 and continuing regu regularly then. Uh, since then. And we will ask what is gained and what is lost for, by framing academic freedom as a development within the broader uh, uh, frame of human rights. Our third uh, pod is academic freedom, freedom of speech, 
and responsibility and the relationships between academic freedom and freedom of speech are uh, problematic. They need serious unpackings and we will unpack them as misunderstandings, disagreements uh, and agreements in which we hope to grasp, uh, uh, isolate and identify uh, core consensus and volatile peripheries around that consensus. Our fourth uh, pod looks at academic freedom and professional and public responsibility, regulation, limits and responsibilities, because academic freedom is nested in uh, and navigates through a whole host of formal and informal uh, responsibilities from stipulations of, uh, in say, academic health sciences, uh, in academic law, uh, academic engineering, so that there are a whole, whole series of codes of conduct, of explicit expectations and so on. So the, uh, the professional colleges within our institutions uh, are no strangers to responsibility codified in particular ways. But there's also the idea of the academic as a professional in a wide inclusive sense. So we'll be looking at the two uh, versions of the professional and the kinds of responsibilities that they uh, uh, recognize, uh, comply with, recurrently interrogate in the way to, in, 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 in order to uh, improve their own practice. So those are the, the, the four frames or lenses. Uh, we're working separately at the moment uh, the four pods. Uh, after this event, we will bring our, uh, our, our thoughts together and bring the, the, the fruits of those thoughts into the main group. And they will, will then work with that to decide which forms of dissemination would be most productive and which ones can most uh, fully uh, populate this notion of the toolkit, uh, this list of tools to think with that may lead to the kind of thinking that will give us more productive exchanges and more beneficial outcomes in individual career cases, in departments and disciplines, in, in colleges and in entire institutions. So that's where we're going. Early days, we look forward to your thoughts. Merci beaucoup, Len. OK, je vais passer la parole à nos commentatrices. Alors, uh, Professor Smith, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. And I would like to begin by thanking the Royal Society for this invitation to speak to you this morning. Um, and also, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Tree Seven Territory, which is also the, uh, the homelands of the Midi Nation Region 3. I want to offer some remarks primarily as a provocation to our discussions. And I want to begin by stating something that I think might be less obvious, that the ways in which we talk about academic freedom and human rights and human dignity are often pitted as irreconcilable differences, um, are, are pitted as competing rights and values, uh, are, are pitted as actually as human rights as actually subordinate or secondary to academic freedom. So I want to, to begin by offering a historical remarks on this idea of academic freedom and its relationship or its emergence in the context of colonialism, apartheid and segregation. It cannot be separated from the structure. Um, and then secondly, I want to invite us to reflect upon the ways in which academic freedom has emerged in the university, in the North American universities, which are colonial inheritance and which are under some pressure today by critiques that are enabled by the, which you may say the margins moving to the center or that are enabled by a critical mass of racialized and indigenous scholars in the academy. I do not think the two are in, in, inseparable. And thirdly, I want to ask a, a serious question about how do we understand the public university as a space of learning, as a space of knowledge production, all of the values and, 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 and pursuits that uh, Professor Finley highlighted, 
who do we imagine these rights and pursuits for? So let me begin by stating this point. So what is and ought to be the relationship between academic freedom and an equitable and inclusive university? What is the relationship between academic freedom and human rights? We think of academic freedom as a human right, but who has rights to rights? When academic freedom emerged in the context of some people being understood as subhuman, as outside the parameters of the academy. So whether academic freedom is understood as the cardinal right under which all others are secondary, i.e. as one scholar put it, academic freedom trumps equity um, as competing rights. And then the question is how do you weigh them? It's a question of judgment. Uh, in, in these competing rights and how do we weigh them as I think often in my experience in the academy as zero sum. Either we have academic freedom or we have an equitable inclusive university. This formulation often leads paradoxically to the view that an equitable university, an inclusive university is by definition an authoritarian university. Which, um, so that, that the, an equity or an inclusive university paradoxically enables oppressive, something that's oppressive to the freedom of the researcher or scholar. So we can recall Stanley Fisher's claim that academic freedom is a way of thought that elevates pettiness, boorishness, and irresponsibility to the status of virtue. It evacuates morality by making all assertions equivalent and because equivalent and consequential. But academic freedom mobilized in this way as a political weapon that in, quote, invites forceful agendas in, but only on its own terms and refuses to grant legitimacy to the terms within which such agendas define themselves. And I want to come back to the terms in which such agendas define themselves because I think they remain once shaped by the coloniality of the institutions in which we work. But academic freedom need not be pitted as necessarily in opposition to, to, um, to uh, uh, equity or human rights um, because it is, not an, it is not an exemption or immunity um, from responsibility as the Royal Society's panel is tasked with understanding and it's not free from social cost so that freedom also comes with cost. Academic freedom, I think the value that we ought to be looking at is the question of accountability to use the research of Lynn Smith. In public institutions committed to the public good that, that is vital to the health of the very democracies that, that are necessary to the, for universities to thrive, we need to elevate um, and the idea of accountability to hold faculty, staff, students, and university administrators, like myself, who is often argued don't have academic freedom, uh, to a higher account for the spaces that we create, whether these spaces are, are ones that are truly supportive of not just learning, but also human freedom and human flourishing. So, it, it, it links to the question, what is the relationship of academic freedom to human flourishing? So the foes of the inclusive university call it the intrusive university. You think of John Fekety. Uh, they talk about the bureaucratization of the codes that uh, Professor Finley uh, identified, whether these codes actually, in, on the one hand, do they protect the rights of the vulnerable, those on the margins, or do they erode academic freedom? And it begs the question, who has a right to rights and whose freedoms are being preserved or rejected? Others reject human rights to sectarian categorization of people by race, gender, class. Again, forgetting that the idea of race, gender, class would be reduced to identity politics emerge in, as a necessary concern with protecting human rights. 
So the only way we can refer to this as sectarian is to forget that some people had no right to rights. And that is as true in the university as the poor society. So what is the heart of these claims is this also centering the right of the individual, the individual sovereignty over any idea of the collective or the public or public sovereignty. Um, and so paradoxically in the, par in the public university, we see the right to have rights is very individualized. Let's not forget that the origins of academic freedom uh, and uh, emerged in the 1940s. They, uh, they stress the need for uh, freedom to research, to teach, uh, for intramural speech, extramural speech, all vitally important, all needing defense as we see with the political interventions and interference in the university. But let's not forget that this was five years before the decolonization in much of Asia and Latin America. 1945 to 1960 was when most of this occurred. Dozens of states were colonized. The, the, and so we are talking about academic freedom emerging in an environment in which many were unfree in, in universities in Canada, in the United States, um, as, we, as they were affirming these fundamental principles of academic freedom. We also know that this, at the same time, the laws at home and the laws abroad affirm colonialism, strengthen commitment to apartheid, which is a crime against humanity. Academic freedom, indeed freedom, was not a concept for non-white people, for indigenous peoples. It emerged in the context of legalized discrimination, it emerged in the context of separate and equal. And I actually think in the ways in which the, the paradox we face in this contemporary moment is reflected in the emergence of academic freedom with the idea of freedom and liberty. So we need to think about the afterlives of slavery and, and colonialism and how they circumscribe, not just the way academic freedom exists in university, but also the way we think about freedom in relation to, for example, discussions around racism in the academy, discussions around the N-word in the academy, discussions around reconciliation and the naming of buildings. Academic freedom often is evoked as a way, and, and tradition also, as a way of protecting this colonial inheritance, as a way of preserving unwittingly the structures of inequality. So I just want to make one, uh, two other final points. Unlike academic freedom, which has a national body, count, for example, faculty associations, which embed the right in collective agreements, and they ought to be there, there's no comparable defense of human rights and equity. Yes, we have equity offices, and, and I am, I'm a vice provost of one, but there's no comparable defense of, of, of equity and, 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 and inclusion or the ways it's actually rooted on human rights and dignity in the same way they, there is. So there's a structure of inequality a structure of inequity between these kinds of things. And again, I think that emerged from the colonial context in which academic freedom emerged. This has, invites us to think about who has the right to rights, but also what rights, but also who has responsibility. Should responsibility be replaced on those who are, who, who are the beneficiaries of colonialism and slavery? Who is, who's accountable? While some scholars refer to this debate as the uh, one of tension or between competing rights and values, I think we ought to be thinking about them not as conflicting rights, but in the language of Eve Hawk at York University. Hawk stresses that some conceptions of academic freedom um, overshadow issues of justice for racialized members of the academy and suggests that in her view, the more, and I think my view, the more compelling approach is to think about them as to begin with the thinking of academic freedom in relation to, not against free, um, uh, 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 human rights and equity. So academic freedom is relational um, concept. And then that relational concepts better enables us to think about freedom from structural and racial violence or sexual harassment or discrimination. 
This more relational approach to academic freedom would enable us to both confront the historical limits of the, uh, of the emergence of the concept, but also think about the ways in which the concept is often invoked to, to undermine human rights and to reaffirm the idea of some people as non-being uh, in a Fanonian sense. So we need, and finally then, to also think about academic freedom as a, a hard-won right in the same way that human rights and equity are hard-won rights. But these two historical uh, pursuits must be uh, thought about in terms of the purpose of the university, the purpose of the university, a public university, which is not to, not to entrench violence, not to entrench, uh, but to advance the, um, the inviolability of human dignity. So as, um, and so, so I would say drawing an uh, 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 is to think about pedagogy. What does it mean to have an inclusive teaching and learning space? How can our universities be safe space if they are also spaces of violence? So I would argue that we actually need to rethink who has the right to safety and what, and can the university ever be safe? What is the classroom environment in which the N-word is circulated? Do we actually, my, my view is most of the reports that we see tend to stress the freedom of the person using the word rather than the experience or the kind of classroom environment it creates. Is that an enabling environment for learning, for teaching and research? Our focus has been disproportionately on academic freedom, on our expression in our universities. We actually need to turn our attention to thinking about the fundamental value of human rights and human dignity, and whether in fact academic freedom can be mobilized in order to protect those and preserve those, and how academic freedom ought to rest on the same bedrock values as does equity and human rights. Thank you. Merci infiniment. Euh, J'aimerais passer la parole maintenant à la professeure Ravi. Merci Monica. Bonjour à tous et toutes. Euh, je remercie la Société royale pour cette invitation. Euh, je voudrais souligner que l'Université de l'Alberta reconnaît respectueusement que nous sommes situés sur le territoire des traités 6, 7 et 8, terre traditionnelle des Premières Nations et des Métis. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for your very thoughtful insights. Um, I believe that discussions of academic freedom have to be balanced with the knowledge of the social and cultural context in which the academia is embedded. Thinking of academic freedom in terms of academic responsibility implies recognizing the fact that abstract concepts like knowledge and truth are invariably linked to uh, relations of power. In short, we need to view academic freedom as being located in a contested zone where multiplicity of histories, perspectives, and objectives collide and coexist. Furthermore, just because there were no rights breached does not mean that all members of the academic community with rights, whether individual or groups, are able to exercise their rights without constraint. Often there reigns an unwritten code of silence within the space of unequally distributed power relations in academe, such that individuals do not even consider exercising their academic freedom. Maybe we should be looking at who has the power to speak freely and who is able to mobilize this power. That these dynamics are not being adequately recognized as our collective academic responsibility is one of my deepest concerns. Let me now turn to this gap that I notice and observe between rhetoric and practice. Policies on academic freedom state that academic freedom must coincide with diversity, equity, inclusion, and decolonization. I do not have time today to go into all the four pillars of this frame. A close look at diversity and its hidden contradictions will tell us how it seems almost impossible for such language to, to move beyond set binaries. Diversity on our campuses is promoted in two different ways. A, as a corrective action diversity or the advancement of opportunity and representation for rep specific 
underrepresented groups who have been discriminated against because of the race, ethnicity, gender, social class, uh, sexual orientation, et cetera. The second we could term as intellectual or educational diversity suggests that in educational context, it is productive to have a broad representation of voices, experiences, and points of view. These two aims may overlap, but they're also the origins of perpetual conflict. From a corrective action perspective, diversity becomes a priority for historically marginalized groups, while intellectual diversity's aims are presumed to be wider, linguistic, cultural, ideological, political, experiential, et cetera, and very crucial to knowledge production. However, when one considers the limits that are placed on courses offered, on student admissions, on faculty hiring, gains for diversity in the corrective sense are often perceived as coming at the gains for diversity in the pedagogical sense. And even, and I underline this, even as the presence of other bodies become objectified and recovered as teaching moments by the very same people who decry the loss of academic freedom. In the recent events at the University of Ottawa, one can see how the moral view of diversity as perceived by the underrepresented constituencies in higher education came into conflict with the instrumental view. The outcome of the university report on the incident was to reinforce the idea that in order to safeguard freedom and to sustain unconstrained search for knowledge, no word should be excluded. Fair enough, I agree with that, but Exercising academic freedom, freedom is not merely about mastering what I call diversity rhetoric. We need to acknowledge what diversity does. It makes us all uncomfortable. Words are sites of struggle. They are organic. They have lives beyond the confines of the material text. Using them responsibly and in a scholarly way is to understand that their intertextual currency varies within and across cultures. I consider academic responsibility as a mediation of our academic liberty with academic rigor and academic empathy. Example, for example, I, teaching Franz Fanon makes not just white people uncomfortable, it also makes black people and people of color very uncomfortable. But that was a point Fanon was making when he used the N word in his seminal text, Black Skin, White Masks. While Fanon and his literary and cultural legacy of critiquing black subjectivity for the purpose of denouncing colonial racist institutions may be a given to some scholars, it requires a complex and time consuming effort to bring this idea to a 21st century classroom in the global North where diversity prevails in its multiple dimensions, linguistic, historical, ethnic, and pigmentocratic. It requires recognizing that not all black lives or lives of color have had the same histories and that any one given language can convey multiple cultural values and memories. Academic responsibility, I would argue, is about expressing our rights as academics in a transdisciplinary manner. That is within multiple related contexts and systems and responding to needs of multiple constituents simultaneously. In the context of the University of Ottawa controversy, the reason for the excessive outrage expressed on both sides of the conflict, the refusal to show empathy in the name of an objective search for truth, the refusal to engage with complex concepts in the name of discrimination becomes clear to me because I constantly and anxiously tread this very thin line between Anglophone and Francophone philosophical traditions on a daily basis. I don't fit into any of the dominant disciplinary and cultural categories of difference in my professional context. As a person of color, of South Asian origin, specializing in Francophone comparative literary and cultural studies, working in a Francophone minority language institution, where the internationalized classroom is a space of intersecting colonial and post-colonial histories, perspectives, and multiple trajectories of Francophoneness. Building trust in a contested space takes time. It takes effort, and it takes transdisciplinary thinking. The Royal Society, I believe, can play an important role in leading the way by thinking beyond its own very disciplinary approach to recognizing excellence. It is my hope 
that it'll be able to influence grant giving bodies and institutions and provide them with the tools to assess and recognize such trans transdisciplinary research. Tuck and Yang have drawn our attention to the fact that education research superficially adopts the language of decolonization in very problematic ways. They argue that using the term decolonization as a metaphor for other things that we want to do to improve our society actually, and I quote, kills the very possibility of decolonization. It recenters whiteness, it resettles theory, end of quote. In a similar manner, I think instrumentalizing diversity has resulted in whitewashing diversity and polarizing opinions. Those claiming loss of educational liberty might want to consider that bureaucratizing diversity in higher education is to ignore that diversity work is ongoing, it is integrated, and it's uncomfortable. In conclusion, I would like to A, reiterate my concern for those who do not have the platform to voice their inability to express academic freedom, and B, make an appeal for an ethics of transdisciplinarity, which would allow us to talk about academic responsibility, an academic responsibility that is socioculturally inflected, that is holistic and empathetic, instead of brandishing an abstract notion of academic freedom. Thank you. Merci. Merci infiniment, Professor Avi. I would like to repasser la parole maintenant à notre collègue, uh, Professor Baptiste. In Canada, since 1982, the decolonization of Canada has affirmed Aboriginal and treaty rights in the Constitution of Canada. Unlike academic freedom that doesn't have statutory or constitutional rights, Indigenous knowledges are embedded within Aboriginal treaty rights. Aboriginal, treaty, Aboriginal rights are probably the least understood. They are the rights that were not given to Indigenous people, but what they had before they entered into relationships with settlers who came on this land. So um, Aboriginal rights includes their languages, their knowledges, their cultures, their communities, their laws, um, their governances, and so on. And all of these kinds of things are what Indigenous knowledges hold as a protection um, under the Constitution. There's a section also in the Constitution of Canada that says that other rights, individual rights um, of uh, charter rights, are cannot abrogate the uh, rights of Indigenous peoples under these um, Aboriginal and treaty rights. So basically what we have is a period of decolonization in Canada, 1982, that marks the starting point for um, not a, of the uh, affirmation in Canada of the constitutional rights of Indigenous knowledges. And so what we are, I'm, I'm suggesting is that academic freedom and other kinds of collegial governance processes in the institution must now consider what does that mean in relation to Indigenous knowledge systems. Um, I I would say that colonialism has greatly reduced and marginalized indigenous knowledge systems, and in some cases actually destroyed the languages of them. Colonial systems um, and settlers have contributed to those tragedies and the denial of indigenous knowledge systems in schools, universities, and other colonial venues. Um, in you know, part of what the in uh, Eurocentric knowledge systems and at that are, are part of universities around the world have supported the building of a hierarchy of knowledge systems and have rewards for it for certain knowledges, but not for others, and consistently denying Indigenous people the autonomy of their knowledges. Through Indian residential schools, past concurrent provincial curriculum in schools and the Canadian university and colleges have instrumentally denied diminished indigenous knowledges in what I have called in my work, cognitive imperialism. The Renaissance movements of indigenous peoples have contributed to some of the most significant changes in these structures in the last half century. 
uh, the constitutional affirmation of indigenous knowledge systems as existing average treaty rights, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People have been the product of the resurgence and the survivance of indigenous peoples. Uh, knowledge is um, and the, um, in and through the, the recognition that those knowledges need to be part of all the systems, whether they are health, child welfare, justice, um, research, publications, and so on, and education. Indeed, the extensive research of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1996 and the testimonies and su survivors in their Indian residential schools leading to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 call to action have strengthened Indigenous peoples' resolve to recover their knowledges locally and nationally. And there's been several movements that have been significant in this period of time that are important to mention, um, and among them have been the Tri-Council Policy Statement that affirms uh, that traditional knowledges are recognized in research and academia, and they are include the knowledges held by First Nations, Inuit, Métis people, specific to place, usually transmitted orally and rooted in the experience of multiple generations. Knowledge may be expressed in symbols, art, ceremony, and everyday practices, narratives, and especially in relationships. Uh, the word tradition is not necessarily synonymous with the old, rather traditional knowledge is held collectively by all members of a community, although some members may ha have responsibility for its transmission. It includes preserved knowledge created by and received from past generations and innovations and new knowledge transmitted to subsequent generations. Um, I'd also point out that University of Canada in 2015 noted the importance Get her back quickly. <laughs> I will say, if I can hold this, that uh, okay. Quickly, I'm just going to say that there's some that the the work of universities can do recognition of the prioritization of indigenous education and the importance of the mutual respect for different ways of knowing and recognizing the intellectual contributions of indigenous people is essential to building trust, understanding and sharing. Uh, Kout's work in the indigenization, um, indigenizing um, of the academy in the 26 policy statements is a really important one that helps uh, uh, in institutions, universities um, affirm uh, the commitment to a proactive approach for restore, restoring, renewing, and regenerating indigenous knowledges, uh, languages, and their practices. What I will conclude with is just to say, because I have I don't know when I'm gonna kick out again, is that academic freedom must be adjusted to respect the constitutional protected indigenous knowledges as distinct knowledge systems um, and that the past wrongs demand a rethinking of academic freedom and its privileges in decolonization. It requires deeper comprehension of the, of the relations between indigenous knowledge systems and Eurocentric knowledge systems in trans-systemic forms of consultation, negotiation, and applications of academic freedom and responsibility across systems. I don't know if anybody caught anything. <laughs> yes, we had, I, merci infiniment. So we got, I think, some very important chunks. I'm glad you have it written down because at least we have text <laughs> that we can refer to. Thank you so much. Et merci de la patience et du courage. We're, we got the point through. So we do have a few more. We have about 10 minutes uh, for, for Q&A. Um, for those of you who are with us, uh, please do submit questions through Slido. I'm not good at the techno stuff. Um, or through the chat box. Um, and they will be fed through to me. So I'm just going to keep looking over to the right to see if there are questions that come up. Um, but I think maybe first, 
uh, what I would like to do while we wait to see if there are questions, I'm going to actually ask Len, um, who needs to take all of this back and bring it back to the group. Are there questions, Len, that you would like to ask? Uh, first of all, let me register my deep gratitude for the cumulative impact of, of our three discussants in their characterization of the promise of the academy the deficiencies of the academy and the necessary changes that the academy may come to. It strikes me that those who are supposed to be the supreme knowledge keepers uh, in Canada within the settler uh, uh, hierarchy of knowledge systems uh, and uh, the Canadian public and, and those who, who uh, uh, represent us in, in politics uh, seem not to realize that what they consider a problem that suppressed populations, people who had to seek their own political emancipation on the road to justice, have already done the work which makes the transformation possible. Uh, Melinda and Sulata point to uh, the 1945 to say 1970, that one of the great global accompl intellectual accomplishments of the 20th century was the work of Fanon uh, and a whole cohort of decolonizers who in all sorts of different ways exposed what uh, the wretched of the earth could see and, and were still experiencing. Uh, and then this gave rise to a whole kinds of creative re renaissance as well as intellectual and political critique. And uh, it was regarded as just, you know, the bad manners of the hitherto rule. Uh, as forms of inconvenient insurgency, uh, as forms of just really not getting the real benefits and virtues of empire. Uh, in Canada, in, uh, in after, 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 after the con constitutional recognition, in Canada, the long march at the, of, of indigenous Canadian diplomacy at the UN, which culminated in UNDRIP, uh, was an astonishing, not only political, but intellectual accomplishment. We remember the uh, Humphreys in 1948. Uh, we remember the Nobel Prize for Lester Pearson. We are happy about that portion of settler ownership of the human rights story in Canada and outside Canada. But there is a, a failure to recognize all those indigenous knowledge keepers, intellectuals, and their allies who worked at the UN to uh, accomplish this extraordinary thing. Why, I ask the discussants, uh, when, why this form of obtuseness and settler ingratitude when those who have suffered worst at the, at the, at the hands of, of colonialists uh, have done so much remediation work and rethinking already. Thank you. So uh, maybe we'll see if, if Marie's connection is working. Do you wanna, I'll give you each like a minute, two minutes to respond. Marie, do you wanna start? <laughs> Yes, I would start if I knew what his question was. <laughs> I, I, I caught the beginning, but then it cut out at the end when he, when he got started to with the question. So, Len, quickly, what was the question? Why, uh, why haven't people in mainstream so-called Canadian society failed to recognize that Indigenous people have done the work necessary for the changes already? <laughs> Why haven't they? Um, I, I, I think that they have noted it um, as resistance, rebellion, um, and not as intellectual 
um, fervor and and contribution. I think that they have witnessed the the strength of the Renaissance, but they interpret it as a complete um, uh, destruction of their own ways of thinking and modes. And and as such, there has been more resistance and more fortification of the the systems that even as they try to uh, feel uh, uh, virtuous for letting people in, uh, that they still hold them to account through their own disciplinary traditions and methodologies um, and that has not opened up the, the, the Eurocentric doors um, to other knowledge systems or to other. Oh, okay, we've lost Marie. We have five minutes. So I'm going to now ask uh, if it's okay with you to uh, ask Professor Ravi to comment briefly. Um, yeah, very quickly, and this is the point that I first made. I think um, the institutions first must recognize that concepts like knowledge and truth are linked to power relations of power. So it's about holding on to power or conceding that power. <laughs> it just boils down to that, really. And, and that would mean uh, conceding, or it would mean to rethink or unthink uh, the certain kind of disciplinary bind binds that sustain that that those power systems. So one, uh, so that's that. To me, that's you know, in very very in a concise way to, to respond to your question. Um, yeah. yeah. Merci. Merci. Professor Smith. Thanks for the question, Len, and the commentary. I think my, my entry into this would be to say that we actually need to rethink the structure of inequities that are embedded within the academy. So, the, the, and, and by that, I mean that the very design of the institution, the rules and regulations and organizational structures are, are designed to maintain certain kinds of relationship. So the, the language of decolonization actually, it, it requires us to rethink, redesign, so, so the unsettling piece and to change that. So I, when I come into academic freedom, which emerged in the context of colonialism and, 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 and segregation, does it have the conceptual bandwidth to actually to, to, to rethink itself, to enable a different kind of a university and space? Or is it so entrenched in the structures that it actually is path dependent and continues to re reproduce and reaffirm and entrench those colonial orders? And so it seems to me this idea of relationality and relationship that we come in through indigenous people, but also that Hawk refers to, to think of it as relational too, but invite a deeper kind of question from the ones that we are currently having, which always makes the question of justice and human rights and equity subordinate to academic freedom. That's an empty notion of academic freedom is if the whole, a whole vast humanity are left outside of its domain. Merci infiniment. So we only have a few minutes left. I think maybe it's time to close the, the session. J'aimerais vous remercier, uh, Len, et nos commentatrices. Uh, I, je nous félicite d'avoir fait un si bon choix uh, d'intervenant d'interlocutrice. And uh, I hope that this conversation will continue. You've made, I think, really important points, Len will take this back and and, uh, and work through these issues with the working group, but I hope this is not the end of the conversation. And for those of you who are participating, by all means, if there are further uh, questions or comments, uh, please do uh, get in touch with us. Uh, we're very open, we're very interested in getting feedback at this particular time. Merci encore, uh, merci infiniment de votre collaboration, de votre participation. Ça a été vraiment extrêmement important, extrêmement stimulant euh, comme, euh, comme discussion. Dommage qu'on a juste une heure. And uh, unfortunately for the technical glitches, uh, but I hope we will have another chance. Merci et à la prochaine. Merci Monica. Merci Anne. Merci à toutes les autres.
Au revoir.